Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. I fundamentally believe that Oregon should be the best place to live and work in this country. And I just think bully is a big part of that. If we empower our businesses to do the right thing, then they will most of the time do it. And we need to be effective with the use of that money so that we're creating programs that can be replicated throughout the state. The role at Bully is not a driver of policy. Really, it's an enforcement agency. It's the democratically elected legislature is going to come up with their ideas and then Bully is there to enforce it. All right, folks, uh, this week we bring you a conversation with Christina Stevenson. Christina Stevenson is one of the two candidates for labor commissioner that we will all be voting on this November. She came very close to winning um, outright in the primary, um, but uh, there were enough candidates to split the vote that the the runoff will be her and Sherry Helt. Um, Sherry Helt, of course, a former Republican state legislator from Bend. We did an interview with Sherry Helt uh, a few months ago. We recommend you check out that interview so you can compare. I actually think listening to these two interviews will give you a, a flavor of how they're different, how they're similar. Um, but the conversation with Christina, I thought was super interesting. Uh, her background, she went to American University, U of O Law School. Uh, she was a Wayne Morse Law Fellow there. Uh, Alex and I were both in the Wayne Morse Scholars Program. So shout out to our friends at the Wayne Morse Center at U of O. Um, She's been working in uh, in the legal world for um, several years. She opened a law firm, I think she said, uh, about seven years ago, um, and is a small business owner as head of that firm and is now running for Bully. She ran for state uh, representative as a Democrat in uh, a primary in an open seat last cycle. I think she came in second place in that race um, and then stepped up to run for Bully this time and uh, has broad support from most of the progressive um, organizations in Oregon. But as she mentions in the episode, she's also got endorsements from some you know, Republican and independent um, folks as well. Um, so Alex, what did you think of the conversation with Christina? Yeah, it was a really detailed interview of the person who will probably become the next commissioner of Bully. Uh, just based on the last election results, I think a lot of people would be uh, very surprised if she was not the bully come come this November. Uh, and yeah, the thing I thought actually Ben was most interesting is I think most of the issues they talked about between her and Sherry, there's at least general alignment of how they should work. And then I think there's definitely some key distinctions such as around uh, the Sweet Cakes case. But uh, it is pretty interesting to see kind of generally how bipartisan both the candidates are looking at bully and the changes that have to be made. So I uh, that's uh, That was particularly unique for me because as we've talked about on most episodes that politics seems to be moving much further to both sides. And this one, it seems to be pretty hard alignment on most of the major issues. Uh, I think that the execution looks different, but uh, again, I think that was, that was kind of sparking to me. I thought there'd be a really wide different range of views, but it seemed to be pretty close alignment on kind of the most pressing issues if both of them were to become commissioner. No, I, I agree with that. And I think what, what stood out to me, we were joking about this before, but like uh, she has a Christina has a like very high attention to detail. She like explains she literally like explains what the meaning of the appeals court decision in the Sweet Cakes um, decision meant in the Sweet Cakes case meant. Um, so I, I enjoyed that part of the conversation as well. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Thank you so much for listening and we will see you back here next week. Thanks, everyone. All right, Christina Stevenson, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Long time listener, first time guest. Very excited to have you. Uh, so our, our first question, just on a basic level, why are you running for Bully? This is like, in fact, we'll talk a little bit about this later in the in the interview but like i think it's a very challenging job you're basically the head of a state agency you're woefully undercompensated um but it's a really important job that does a lot of important work so i'm curious um what made you decide to jump into the race yeah i mean just, just to kind of give you a sense of, of my background so born and raised in washington county in the rural part of washington county uh, my parents had a business for 30 years in the community and so you know, during the summers when I wasn't uh, answering phones and filing paperwork, I was 
you know, the, I was the kid that had my parents take me to the Powell's technical assistance uh, or technical uh, books and go get like the math book. So I could read that <laughs> over the summer and try to teach myself uh, different types of math. So, uh, you know, it was like education, super important uh, in my family. My, I was the first in my family to graduate college and that was, you know, a really big deal. And, you know, that, that sort of led me then next to law school. And now what I do is, is most of what I do in my day job is representing workers when they're getting a raw deal from employers, when those employers are not following the rules enshrined by the Bureau of Labor and Industries. So that's rules like not paying workers all of their wages, you know, rules like not discriminating against people based on their race or sexual orientation, um, not retaliating against employees when they raise safety issues. And so, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing the last, over the last 10 years. And, you know, my, my tiny law firm has gone toe to toe with, you know, Wall Street's biggest banks, you know, billion dollar companies like Wells Fargo. Uh, We did so on behalf of an employee that blew the whistle on fraud and, you know, we beat them in court. And I'm damn proud of that. Uh, But I know, you know, I know from experience that so many employees don't know their rights. They don't know the help they can receive from Bully. And, you know, on the other side, I I own and operate a business, you know, uh, a business I started at the kitchen table when my son was just three months old. I know, yeah, I, I know what it means to run payroll every month, you know, to pay the taxes, salaries, benefits. I mean, I, I have to comply with the same rules as everybody else. I, I also help other employers comply with those rules. And, you know, again, but again, you know, I think there are many employers that, that just don't know their responsibilities and don't know the help it can receive from bully and understanding those responsibilities. And like, I just, you know, I fundamentally believe that Oregon should be the best place to live and work in this country. And I just think bully is a big part of that. Uh, We are in the process of incorporating uh, this, this business, the Oregon 360 media business. And I've been complaining to Alex throughout the process about (laughs) how hard it is and how challenging it is. And so it's, I cannot imagine doing it with a three month old (laughs) and trying to be a parent. Uh, How old, how old is your, is your kid now? Um, Eight and a half. So what what's the what's the campaigning for office as mother of a relatively young child part of the job look like? How's that been? Oh, I mean, it's been awesome. I mean, honestly, he comes with me to almost everything. You know, like there there was a you know Portland's kind of Better Business Chamber event where there was a you know roller skating. You know, I, I always love it when people make it family family friendly for that, but. He comes to everything with me and he loves to go canvassing and, and our, our friends in Bend, they actually like, they have literal stumps in front of their um, house. And so he has been getting up there and doing his own little stump speeches. It's oh, really future. sweet. Future candidate. <laughs> well, very good. Uh, and then I want to ask you kind of just a couple questions about Bully itself, uh, which maybe some of these you don't even know. Cause I, you know, maybe that uh, sort of things you'll obviously learn very quickly if, if you win the race. But you talked about things like uh, employees not getting paid, discrimination happening in the workplace and things like that. Uh, just kind of curious of how often does that actually happen? Like uh, I own a business. We have about 20 people. Uh, I couldn't imagine not paying my people. That's just one is obviously illegal, but incredibly uh, immoral. But how how often does this stuff actually come up in terms of because I know I remember when we had Commissioner Hoyle on, she said that Bully was one of the smaller uh, agencies from a staff perspective, too. Just kind of curious in terms of like, how often did things like that actually happen? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. I, I mean, I think just like broad brush, most of our employers in Oregon are are doing the right thing and want to do the right thing. Uh, so in terms of how often it's, it's happening, I was just trying to... Uh, look through the numbers, but my memory is the, the bully complaints are somewhere in the, you know, few thousands um, right now in terms of the civil rights complaints, but I, I can double check that for you, but just to give people kind of, kind of a flavor. And, and I think that that is, you know, part of what, what we want to 
you know, recognize is that if we empower our businesses to do the right thing, then they, they will most of the time do it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And that was more sort of just a question out of, out of curiosity. Uh, so I'm curious because you, of course, and we'll talk about the politics of the race uh, a little bit later in the podcast, but uh, you did almost win outright in the first election, uh, I guess the first election, the first portion of the election. If I'm not mistaken, you came within like a point or two, uh, basically wrapping things up, which I think, uh, unfortunately, I'm sure that would have made your family and then you much happier if you just kind of <laughs> won the race right there rather than have to face off against Sherry uh, come in November. But uh, in terms of kind of, uh, what do you see as like day one priorities in terms of what you of, of if you were to take office? Because I thought one of the most interesting things was just kind of the the different set of priorities in terms of because we talked to I mean, you're our third person now who we've interviewed who's, you know, either running for bully or is actually taking the head of bully in terms of Commissioner Hoyle. Uh, and she had very different things to say than Sherry. Sherry talked about like investments in new technology because the computer systems that bully using are like from the 1960s or 1970s or something like that. I didn't even know they had those type of systems in the 60s or 70s. Uh, but just kind of curious to hear in terms of like day one priorities, if you were to win office, what do you think that kind of looks like? Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, it's no secret that working families and small businesses are struggling with rising costs with inflation. And so we were just going to be laser focused on the workforce piece of that puzzle, because as you probably know, bullies, you know, one of the core components is to promote the development of a highly skilled workforce um, through the apprenticeship programs. And Bully is is the steward of a, of a one-time investment for, through the Future Ready Oregon package of about $20 million, about $18 million or so uh, for actual grants and apprenticeship programs. And so this is money that is for pre-apprenticeship programs in construction, healthcare, manufacturing, and for apprenticeship programs in healthcare and manufacturing and targeting that money to, to certain uh, targeted communities that are set in statute. So that is what Bowley has, you know, started to to undertake and I think uh, has has uh, allocated uh, under two million dollars of that so far there's going to be several different rounds of funding but you know making sure that we are using that money to its full effect it is going to be absolutely crucial right I mean this is taxpayer dollars. And we need to be uh, effective with the use of that money so that we're uh, we're creating programs that can be replicated throughout the state, you know, programs that can be used in our rural communities, programs that that are actually going to give us the, the benefits that we want, you know, bang for our buck. So that's going to be where I'm absolutely focused on. Gotcha. And I'm curious to hear just kind of your thoughts on like workforce development and apprenticeships in general, because I feel like, uh, and I actually don't think anyone we've had on the podcast has done has done this, but I feel like in terms of the national debate, apprenticeships always turns into two things. One, it's either Republicans basically saying, we need to send people to trade schools, then that's just kind of where the stop of the policy is. Then on the Democratic side, it talks about like, people are going to build all these like solar panels and wind panels across like the whole country and like, 20% of the country is going to build solar panels, which to me always, say, I'm sure there's some truth there, but to me always sounds a little bit silly. From your perspective in terms of sort of how to shape the apprenticeship programs and then like what the industries that they should focus on, uh, I'm really curious to hear sort of like, what are the areas that Oregon needs to focus on specifically compared to maybe sort of more like a national work program, if that makes sense? Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And that's what I've been, you know, part of this process, right, in running for office is talking to a lot of people. And so in my travels, that's one of the questions I've been trying to answer is, who has a plan for how we think about our workforce? Because we know, uh, without a plan, what we end up with is, is what we have now, which is a complete mismatch in the skills that people have versus the, the skills that our businesses need. So, uh, you know, I've been talking to Portland Business Alliance, Oregon uh, Business Council, looking at the Oregon, uh, with the, the Oregon business plan. And I think the, the thing that needs to happen is there needs to be more of a convening. So we have all these disparate places that are 
thinking about a little slice of this puzzle, um, but we need more coordination to make sure that they're actually thinking through, you know, not, not, we, we have a, obviously acute shortages in places like healthcare and education, but also thinking 10 years down the road, what, what we need, and then working back from there. So right now there's not, for example, a, a dedicated partnership at Boley with, with K-12. And, and to me, that's a, that is an area that we need to be focusing on. So even, you know, telling our kids that this is even an option, right? I know that would have been life-changing in my community if people could have heard the message that, that, look, you don't have to go to college. You can actually, you know, earn while you learn, not take out a ton of debt, and then you're in a, you know, a family wage career. So those are, those are the pieces. I love that, um, especially as a school board member, uh, where there is a huge shortage of education. And even like K-12 after the Student Success, Student Success Act is trying to hire more like social, emotional, mental health supports, physical health supports, and we can't find those employees either. And I think part of it too that I've been thinking about is like, where did you go to uh, undergrad, Christina? American in D.C. Oh, you went in D.C. So Alex and I went to U of O. Um, so I'm curious if it's different at a private school, but like, Alex, I don't feel like anyone ever had a conversation with me about like, here are some potential career paths that you could take with this degree. Here are careers where there's lots of, there's lots of opportunity and there's shortages. Like here are things to consider. Like there's, we tell everyone go to higher ed. It's really important, really valuable. And I think the apprenticeship narrative is shifting a little bit. I think there's more of a focus there, but like, we don't connect very well to your point about convening. There's no one, there's no table where we're like talking about how to connect our, our future workforce to opportunities in the, in the market. So I think, well, you're, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think even Ben, because I had double major in economics and political science, and I thought the economics department actually did a great job. They said, you can use econometrics. You could go work in consulting. You could work for, you know, an economic development firm. You could do that sort of thing. In terms of political science, I thought there was basically no career guidance that was given for like, not even like, oh, maybe you could go like work in the state legislature or something like that wasn't even really mentioned. And I mean, I went to Westland High School, one of the best high schools in the state ranked nationally, of course. And even that conversation was always directed more so at what college are you going to go to? Uh, which is great. I mean, college is clearly for most people a rise up the income ladder. But uh, for kind of as Christine was saying, in terms of the people who it's not, there was really like no career paths or other sort of options talked about, or really even like, hey, you're about to graduate, like, what are you going to do with your life sort of thing. Uh, and I feel like that's pretty easy things to grab at considering that students are already in school anyway. So yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think it's like, because there's there's some people who say that we should we should like limit the number i think this is more of a right-wing proposal we should limit the number of like soft degrees social science degrees or whatever which uh marshall kozloff has been talking about this on the realignment like the downside with that proposal is you basically are tracking like people who are from upper incomes who can afford to like take a political science class or take us be a political science major end up having the privilege and opportunity to kind of take the softer science, less clear job professional opportunities, um, degrees versus like, if you have fewer number of slots, like you end up tracking lower income students who go to college have to focus on STEM degrees or things that like, you know, and I think like, that's not the right answer, but we do, we do have to do a better job of connecting opportunities um, to students who are trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Um, yeah. I mean, I, and also it's just vital for our economy, right? I mean, we've got, uh, things like housing shortage, like who's going to build these <laughs> things, right? So uh, yeah, that'll be a huge focus. And the the one exception I will say, which, uh, so Christina, you were a Wayne Morse Law Fellow at U of O? Yes. Yeah. So what I will say is the one place at U of O where I felt like they did an excellent job of trying to help us figure out like where we were going to go was the Wayne Moore Scholars Program, which is frankly more like almost like a private school environment because it's a small group of people. You've got like, you know, prestigious professors who know you personally. So shout out to the Wayne Morse uh, Program at U of O. We are big fans. Um, so worst transition ever, but I'm going to move to a policy issue that matters a lot to me. 
um and i think to a lot of voters and it's the it's sweet cakes it's the lgbtq um rights um you know how you view civil rights versus religious liberty like this is obviously, I think, not a huge part of the day-to-day -day work of Bowley. I don't think this is happening on a really frequent basis, but it does happen in this state. And it, when it does happen, it's pretty high profile and it impacts people in a pretty severe way. And I'm talking about discrimination against people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And obviously, the Sweet Cakes decision is like the famous one. It went all the way up the, the legal ladder. Um you know, different people have different takeaways about what the decision meant. But I, I guess I'm curious, Frank, like people should listen to the episode with, with um, Sherry Helt, the other candidate running for Bully, because I, we, we spent some time talking about this. And I'll try my best to summarize in good faith that she was basically saying, like, I think the, the best version of her argument is this is a really divisive time in our politics, like, uh, and we need to respect the religious liberty of people um, who have sincerely held religious beliefs and the rights of LGBT people. And we just need to follow the law. Um, and so I guess that's my question for you is like on the, on issues like this of, you know, on one side, you've got people who are saying, you know, this is my religious freedom, my right to not serve certain people or, you know, I, it gets tricky because to, to Sherry's point, we do have legal protections that say you can't do this, but it's up to bully to decide what happens when you violate those and what the facts of the case say, like in different bully commissioners could say sweet cakes had to pay a fine of a few hundred thousand dollars or $10,000 or, you know, what, like, I think it, it, this is where it matters a great deal who's sitting in the chair and who like what that person's values and beliefs are in terms of issues like this. So that's a big wind up to just say, like, how do you think about these issues of LGBT rights and religious liberty in the context of bully? Well, I think when we, when we're talking about sweet cakes, I think we have to just start with the, with the fact that this, I mean, this could be a law school seminar uh, would last several weeks. It is incredibly complicated, not just legally, but factually. And a lot of that is, is lost in, in the sound bites that, that come out as, and, and media too, right? I mean, even something as simple as you hear a lot of people say, Bully's fine was uh, egregious. And, and Bully didn't, uh, there was no fine imposed. What happened was that the ALJ awarded damages and that, that's different. So, you know, a fine is something like, hey, I, I didn't wear my seatbelt. I, I got a fine for that. And what happened here was damages were awarded based on emotional distress. So thinking, you know, how, what was the effect on this person the only thing that the law has to compensate people in that situation is money. It's a mm -hmm. blunt instrument for sure. But, you know, you go to Multnomah County court uh, just a couple of weeks ago there, or even days ago, there was a verdict for someone's emotional distress. So the pain that, that hurts that their soul, you know, 900, over $900,000. So just to give people kind of context about uh, the range of emotional distress damages that are awarded by juries and people who listen to the evidence of, of how something affected someone. And, and way more than the sweet case decision, right? Yes, that's right. I believe the, there were, there were two plaintiffs in the sweet cakes. Um, I think one got 75,000, maybe one got 60,000. So um, all told 135,000. And, and since that time, you know, so it went up to, uh, the Supreme Court came back down, Court of Appeals, in the Oregon Court of Appeals decided based on cases that came later, so came much, much later from the original decision of Bowley, that the fine needed to be, or the, the penalty, the uh, emotional distress award needed to be reassessed. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, what just happened uh, you know, a, a couple of months ago, Bully reassessed that uh, emotional distress award and reduced it. So without it going deeply, because you, you could, we could go really, really deeply in this particular decision. I think what I want your listeners to think about is I'm just going to read part of part of the decision, because <laughs> this is really what it comes down to. 
So this is what the Court of Appeals told us we should think about in light of the U.S. Supreme Court. Whereas here, a governmental adjudicator is called upon to determine whether a person's conduct violates a generally applicable neutral law. And so the generally applicable neutral law in this case is the law that says you cannot discriminate in public accommodations. Okay, so when you're when an adjudicator is called upon to determine this, and that conduct was motivated by a religious belief, so the, the purveyor of the service, their conduct was motivated by a religious belief, the adjudicator must walk a tight wire, mm. acting scrupulously to ensure that the adjudication targets only the unlawful conduct, the denial of service, and is not in any way the product of the adjudicator's hostility towards the belief itself. And so what this tells me is that the, the next labor commissioner, whoever she may be, you know, needs to make sure that there are processes in place to ensure that there is not even a hint of hostility towards the religious belief in adjudicating our laws. Yeah. And then, uh, Christina, I did want to ask, so I saw on your campaign website that, uh, you were like a, a leader in terms of uh, advocacy for the legislature and activism to helping to pass the paid family leave. Uh, and that was something that I thought was really interesting because if I'm not mistaken, Oregon was either the first or one of the first in the country to actually pass uh, some sort of legislation to push forward on paid family leave. And uh, this is actually an idea that's gotten quite a bit of traction on the right too. Uh, I think probably people disagree with you on terms of how to pay for it, but I think many states or most states over the next five or 10 years will probably enact some sort of policy to help push forward paid family leave in some way. Uh, again, semantics in terms of, I think, who will pay for it, how will we pay for it, but I think that's kind of the direction in terms of where the politics are going. Uh, I'm curious in terms of, you know, you as the head of Bully, obviously you're looking out for, for industry, but you're also looking out for, for labor, of course, too, is where do you kind of see uh, maybe like employee rights? I don't even know if that's the right word to put it, but uh, like if paid family leave was one step, where do you kind of see the the future of it going in terms of more benefits for workers or making work more accessible and things like that? Uh, kind of just curious to hear what your thoughts are broadly on that. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess just starting where you started with, paid family and medical leave insurance, you know, it's, it's a program that, you know, as a small business owner, uh, was really a, attractive to me because it's like an, uh, it's just like unemployment insurance, right? The employers pay a tiny bit. I think it's like half a percent of payroll and then em employees pay a tiny bit. And then when life happens, which, which it does, uh, someone can draw on that bank. And this is something that, you know, I, I sort of got involved in the legislature just as as a constituent, you know, someone who had had an experience, and that experience was my was my dad passing away from cancer, and at that time, you know, I was like I was living paycheck to paycheck, you know, I really needed, uh, I re I wanted to be able to be there for my dad during his cancer treatments, and that that drew, like drew down my bank and it drew down the, the amount that, that I was getting paid. Right. Cause this is all unpaid leave. Um, mm -hmm. and so when he passed away, I learned that my employer could fire me immediately. And to me, I thought this is not the Oregon that we want, right. We don't want a, a place where, you know, it's protected while you're, helping someone through chemo, but as soon as they pass away, uh, your employer could fire you. Um, and so I just did a little research, happened to see that the Oregon legislature was thinking about adding bereavement leave to the Oregon Family Medical Leave Act. And so, you know, I, I rallied my grief support group, then we showed up in Salem and it, it got passed. It was the third time I think it was up. Um, and, you know, that experience is, is why I really really got involved. I think that there was, there's often kind of a false dichotomy that was created between um, what's, what's good for business and what's good for workers. And I felt like 
having having a voice and my expertise was was helpful to be at the table. And so, you know, that that's sort of a long way to, to talk about paid family uh, medical leave. But the the role at Bully is is not a, a driver of policy. Uh, maybe maybe other people have approached it that way at times, but really it's an enforcement agency. It's the democratically elected legislature is going to come up with their ideas and then uh, Bully is there to enforce it. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, and then kind of just curious in terms of, you know, obviously, as I stated before, you're representing both businesses in some way, but then also workers. What's your kind of general approach or maybe philosophy to finding kind of a good middle of the road to that in terms of, you know, making sure that workers' rights are enforced and things like that, but then also making sure that it's easy to do business for people. And uh, I'm a small business owner myself. We have employees in states all across the country. Uh, One thing actually for our conservative listeners who may find this funny, Oregon, I thought was actually one of the easiest states to deal with when it came to setting up a business. Uh, The state of Virginia is the worst place I have ever (laughs) set up a business. I would never set up a business in the state of Virginia. It's an absolute horrible experience. It still is a horrible experience to this day. Uh, but just kind of curious if you blame Alex, do you blame Glenn Youngkin for that? Or is that uh, th- th- this is under the previous <laughs> regime, <laughs> yeah, okay. actually, that, you know, uh, I'm sure they have nothing to do. It, 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 this must go back to like the 50s or 60s or something, but it's it's horrific. Uh, but yeah, kind of just curious of your you know general approach to that in terms of how you're making sure both sides are coming to the table, talking about issues and kind of, you know, addressing uh, different issues, which are, you know, impacting the businesses and the workers in different ways. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the Oregon Secretary of State has this little uh, memo on the history of bully, and it talks about how you know kind of the reason it was created in 1903 was to get people working together on the same page. And I I think that when we think about how both sides can be successful, the the starting place for me is on the front end. So is the employer education, making sure that it is as simple as possible. And I know these laws quite well, right? I've spent, you know, over a decade working with these laws and they're complicated. It is hard. And so what I want to do is make it absolutely easy. And, and what I'm, and I'm talking, you know, flow charts, you know, checklists, and making sure that nobody's interested in some kind of gotcha enforcement, right? We want to empower our businesses to, to know what to do so that we don't even get to the complaint process, right? And then we save our resources for the actual bad actors, you know, the actual folks that are making wage theft their business model. And, and so, you know, there is, I, I'm wanting us to get to a place where where we're recognizing that neither side is, is that 1% worst case, right? And if we treat both sides like it's, it is the, the absolute outlier, then that is, that's not useful for anybody. Businesses need workers, workers need jobs. It's a symbiotic relationship, right? And I think a, a place where we really see this, of course, is apprenticeships, skilled, mm-hmm. skilled work. This is both sides need each other. And this is a great place for us to work together. And then thinking, thinking about, um, you know, the, the narrative that, you know, maybe employers don't want enforcement. I don't think that's accurate. I think employers do want enforcement because they have to play by the rules. And it is a competitive disadvantage for the yeah. good businesses in our state to have to compete with bad actors. So that's how that's how I think about it. That's super helpful. Um, so I've got a couple questions on bully legislative agenda structure of the agency. My first one, and I'm actually genuinely curious how you how you think about this one. So bully. Bully is an independently elected, nonpartisan um, statewide office holder, the head of Bully, um, the commissioner, um, Val Hoyle's current commissioner. She was elected on the ballot. There's no D or R next to her name anymore. There used to be, um, but there isn't. It's a nonpartisan office. 
as a statewide elected, I think the salary range is somewhere in the neighborhood of like between seventy and eighty thousand dollars a year. Um, the head of bully oversees many employees who make far more than that. Um, they're also the head of an agency who like is is essentially a like you're on the clock twenty four seven even if you're not working. So like if you get a call on Friday night or Saturday morning about something blowing up or a newspaper article or whatever, you're responsible for it. And other state agency leaders are making double or more um, what the current salary of a labor the labor commissioner is, depending on the size of the agency. And bully, bully is small compared to like ODE or OHA, but um, there's definitely a lot of small agencies smaller than bully um, in Oregon. I don't know the I don't know how the compensation shakes out there, but I'm curious. Like, obviously, you have stepped up to run for it. You have a law degree. You work in like this is in your wheelhouse. I'm. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to ask you to share how much you make now, but I'm almost certain it will be a pay cut. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, like, A, do you think there's a, like, in general, for leadership positions like this across the state, how, how do you think about compensation and making sure it's fair and equitable and that we're attracting the right people to run? Um, and then B, is there merit to bully being a democratically elected position and answering to voters? Or is there an advantage to having it be appointed by the governor um, as it is in some other states? Like general bully questions um, that I'm curious. You, I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about these kinds of things. So interest, interested in what your perspective is. I mean, when it comes to how we compensate people in state government, I think that it is, you know, what we've seen is it's a challenge in making sure that we have equitable representation because it is expensive to live mm -hmm. in a lot of places in Oregon. And if you want people who are um, able to do the, the full-time job, in the, which is the legislature now, I mean, that's essentially a full-time job. And how, how are they going to live on that salary? I think that when it comes to bully, you know, we're, we're in a little bit better of a position, but I do worry as time goes on that recruiting people to this position is going to be very, very difficult. And it, it's just a policy choice that we all have to decide together. You know, what, what do we want? Do we want people who, you know, are maybe retired or independently wealthy being the only ones who can afford to give public service? Or, or do we want to make sure that we have diverse representation and backgrounds in our elected offices? And uh, that's a choice that, that I think that we, we are, we need to come to terms with sooner rather than later. So before we transition to the the second question, one interesting thing on this that I noticed was like before you jumped in and before um, Sherry Helt jumped in, and I think even before Casey Kula jumped in, there was like this period of time where everyone knew Val was running for Congress, but nobody had stepped up to run for bully. Um, and that doesn't happen in like congressional seats <laughs> um, or seats that are like, you know, the governor's office, like people really kind of know what's going on. And one of my reflections there was like, if Bully was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year job, which would be about in the market of, you know, an agency head who oversees hundreds of employees and like has significant responsibility, um, which by the way is much less than a CEO of a company of that size would be making. Um, I think it it would change the dynamic. Um, and I obviously I think you're qualified. I think Sherry Helt's qualified. Like we ended up having people step forward after you, I assume, had your own conversations internally with your family about making it work. But like there's also a lot of people who passed on running for the job who could have run, um, but decided that it wasn't the right fit for whatever the reason is. So I just think that's interesting context to to your point. Like you in some ways, in some ways you get what you pay for, at least in terms of who steps up to run. And like we've been bailed out by having people for both the legislature and statewide office who I think are like making significant sacrifice to make it work in the name of public service. And this is Democrat and Republican. Like it, this is not a partisan thing. Um, but I think we can do better. And it's a politically, it's obviously a very politically dicey thing when you're talking about compensating elected officials, but I think it's something we should all care about. Um, anyway, off my soapbox. Uh, second part of the question, independently elected, appointed by the governor. How do you think about that question? You know, I think the independence of bully is really important because you want somebody who is going to enforce the law 
no matter who is breaking it. Um, and, you know, we saw that with the state legislature. And I think having that independence is the only way you see Bully bringing those sort of charges of the sexual harassment and, uh, you know, being able to go wherever wherever the the law and facts take you, I think is a really important part of the position. And so basically, if it was appointed by the governor, it's it's too susceptible to like the po- potential political influence, depending on who's in the office versus like if you're independently elected, it's you answer only to voters. Is that basically the theory? Yeah. Okay. I think that's what I think that's similar to what Sherry had said. Um, I think that's probably what Val would say. Um, I think I probably agree with that. I just think we need to it, if we took it out of not being non-elected, it would instantly be considered like it would be like immediately professionalized um and i think that's what attracts me to the other thing but maybe we can have both uh okay alex you're up a, a lot of thoughts going on in ben i know i, I right. think about this a lot and i don't <laughs> i haven't resolved it in my head so i like just talk too much it's like was that a question was that a statement uh, <laughs> uh so so i want to talk a little bit about uh kind of the politics of the race just to to kind of wrap us up here before ben closes us uh I do want to say that, uh, and we didn't talk about all of the issues, but of course we already did, you know, interview Sherry on the podcast. And I think that a lot of the issues that uh, she highlighted are also issues that you had highlighted. So uh, I definitely think it's interesting that, uh, and again, Sherry is not like, I know she considers herself to be a moderate Republican. I know that you consider yourself to be progressive, but it sounds like you're both generally sort of aligned, at least on uh, a, a majority of the issues in terms of kind of where, where bullies should go. Uh, that was a very broad statement. and. I'm curious of of your response to that in terms of what kind of makes you, you know, the most different or what kind of you think really uh, differentiates you and then Sherry in terms of maybe just a couple of key issues. Well, so you you talked about this in the beginning that if this was a a primary, it was a seven way primary and, you know, we got over 47% of the vote. Um, You know, we won 20 counties, including rural counties and, at this point, all of my former competitors, you know, across the ideological spectrum have endorsed me. I have the endorsement of last five labor commissioners, Democrat and Republican, uh, you know, hundreds of, of organizations, elected officials, businesses, labor. And so I think the thing that differentiates me is I, in, in a time and place where we are so polarized, there is one place where people across the spectrum agree, you know, uh, and that is that I am the best person for this job. I'm really excited to work with people from all different, you know, all different backgrounds, because I think what we've seen, I mean, this is data, you know, that the more people who are involved in a decision, the better quality of the decision is, right? And so I want Bully to be a place where we're actually solving problems. You know, we, I will work with anybody who is there to do the work. I mean, it's really simple. And I think a lot of us want the same things. And all we want is just, you know, good, safe jobs, you know, a, a pathway to, to uh, a middle class job, a, a you know, a family wage, and our businesses want the skilled labor to get there. I mean, they they are essentially nonpartisan issues. But having spent, you know, I mean, I, I kind of jokingly say I've had bully on speed dial for over a decade. You know, this is a place where I have a ton of experience and really practical experience. I mean, just to you know, give you a little idea is when we think about technical assistance, you get anybody in here to say, we need more technical assistance for employers. Of course we do. There's 500,000 businesses, but the difference is I have the experience from both sides to tell me exactly how to implement technical assistance. So for example, you're an Oregon employer, you got six or more employees, disability laws apply to you. It's a very complicated area of the law. I see employers mess it up all the time. And I think that I have a plan to make sure that they get it right going forward because of my experience. And and that experience is going to lift all boats. 
Gotcha. And then one thing from the campaigns that I'm curious to is, and as has been alluded to earlier, is that uh, this is technically a nonpartisan office. And I think what always makes races interesting about that, and there's been research on this, is that uh, people are actually much more likely to vote for people across the aisle when the R or the D uh, disappears from the name. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's probably because they don't know who that person is or but I think also a lot of the time it's because they're a lot more open to kind of listening to people because uh, that kind of party identification, you know, goes away. Uh, just curious from a candidate perspective, how it's been kind of campaigning in a race where, uh, again, you can really talk to everybody, you can really try to win every vote. Uh, I'm assuming that, you know, conservatives are not going to like some of your specific policies, but I'm, you know, you probably have a lot more Republicans and independents who are open to listening to you because you don't have the D, you know, right next to your name. Just kind of curious from a candidate perspective, like how that's been, uh, you know, compared to maybe if I was running against Ben, I'm a Republican, Ben's a Democrat, I'm probably not even going to try to talk to Democrats, he's not going to try to talk to Republicans. Yeah, I mean, you know, we saw that in the results in, in terms of who voted for me. It, it was absolutely people across the ideological spectrum. And when it comes to the conversations that I'm able to have without that, uh, without that uh, partisanship layer, I think it it is helpful for us to to have have more conversations and and create more relationships. Um, the the nonpartisan part of of the you know I, well so I'll just say you know I like I said I I grew up my and my dad was a Republican very formative uh, person in my life mom not not super political but probably a, a Democrat right so I grew up in a very purple Oregon <laughs> like mm -hmm. I think a lot of people and I I grew up thinking that we could have civil debates. Right, that we could just talk about issues and not have it be uh, personal attacks. So that's kind of the Oregon I want to get back to is just a place where we're focused on solving problems, no matter uh, what what letters by your name. That is a good place to end it. Uh, so our final question for every episode is if someone was listening and they want to learn more about you or maybe they want to help your campaign, um, where's the be best place for them to go to to be in touch or to learn more? Best place is to go to our website. So it's Christina with a CH, Stevenson with a PH.com. And that'll connect you to all the, all the socials, all the abilities to, to donate, to canvas and get involved. All right. Well, Christina Stevenson, thank you so much for making time to be on the podcast. Uh, we appreciated the conversation and uh, good luck in the election. And if you win, we'll have to have you back to you know talk about how it actually is being bully commissioner. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much for the conversation. Awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and uh, we'll see you next week.